Hello, this is Jessica Pettit, and who do I have the pleasure of interviewing today? Hello, um, I am Tara Fuller, and I serve currently as the Director of Fraternity and Sorority Life at Monmouth University. I also am a speaker with Campus Speak. Excellent. Well, I'm very glad to have you here. And we're kind of starting everything off with uh, two open-ended questions. I have these ideas rolling around in my mind. And based on your lived experience and identities, I can't wait to see what they mean or how they land on you. There's no wrong answers. Uh, The first one is the concept of diversity dividend. So this usually comes up when organizations are asking me about profits related to doing diversity training. So in thinking about investment, action, and return, what does diversity dividend mean to you? Interesting. Um, I am not a businessy person, (laughs) so diversity dividend is like out here for me. Um, I also don't like the idea of quantifying identities, but I understand that that might come from a business-minded person. Um, I do think that when you bring a lot of different lived experiences to the table, you get a fantastic array of perspectives, which can enhance any sort of product that people might be consuming, whether that's a program or something tangible. Um, So I think that that could potentially increase overall dividends, Mm -hmm. though I don't know, I would like the idea of calling it a diversity dividend. Yeah, great. That makes total sense. So the other one, which I think you're going to have a great answer for too, is asterisks, other duties assigned. So sometimes these are things given to you that you are not rewarded for, and sometimes these are things you volunteer for to build your own community. What does asterisks, other duties assigned mean for you? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of these in fraternity and sorority life and higher ed and student affairs in general. Um, The other duties as assigned in terms of um, things that you choose to do that you might volunteer for, I love the idea of. I have been fortunate enough to have supervisors who have been flexible with that. So it's not, I'm working 40 hours a week and then I'm working another 30 because I'm volunteering to get all this additional experience. Um, I think when it's other duties as assigned and it just sort of comes out of left field and you're not rewarded for it, that can be really um, time consuming, it can really sort of get into the way of self care, being a good professional, because you're just sort of it contributes to burnout. I mean, I think we especially see that in student affairs is people burning out because they're being pulled in 17 different directions, four of which were the only directions they thought they were getting themselves into. Mm -hmm. It's interesting is that this theme is kind of arriving arising that other duties assigned can be things you do for self-care and they can also be things that lead to burnout Um, I think as a as a profession is something that we really need to have a conversation about so so in the pre-work and why part of the reason I'm so excited to talk with you other than you're just rad um, you said something in your survey that I really liked how you said it and that when asked about like, okay, so what's your strongest area? Why are you called to do diversity, equity, and inclusion work? You talked about the people see the way their miseducation or assumptions are ab- about different identity groups can impact others. Can you talk a little bit about how your approach allows people to see these things and your own story and connection with that, what that has to do with your work. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with an example of when I saw the work that I do impact someone who sort of unlearned something, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I gave a keynote at my sororities convention. My friend recorded it. I showed it to my parents. And in that keynote, I was talking about LGBTQ inclusion. And so we talked a lot about heteronormativity. And I talked about examples of how we put that on children and the questions that we ask and things like that. And so my dad, who was in his, was in his mid sixties at the time, um, the next morning on the beach was talking to a family friend's kid who was asking us questions about marriage. And he said, Oh, um, you know, yeah, like Pat's my wife, that's my mom. And, um, the kid was like, oh yeah, I don't know if I want a wife or no, I don't know if I want to get married. And my dad said, yeah, who needs a wife anyway? And so I heard it, you know, my dad is in his mid sixties and again, heteronormativity is very ingrained in our culture. So I 
didn't think much of it. Just said, okay, I heard it. We walked down to the water a few seconds later. We were on the beach and he said, did you hear me? I messed up. I messed up. And I was like, okay, you heard it too. That's awesome. Right? Like, I'm like, wow, you can teach an old dog new tricks. This is great. But I do think that so much of the work that needs to be done is just unsocializing people. That is totally not a word, but just this idea that the language that I use and the way that I approach things, whether it's from a place of privilege or a place of social constructs that we've been raised up in really do have the ability to then continue to perpetuate those systems. Mm -hmm. And so talking about things that are really tangible and that people can really see like ability and the structures that are actually built for people with certain abilities and really disenfranchise people without those abilities. Sometimes people just that clicks for them. And they're like, oh my gosh, I never thought about the fact that it only takes me 10 minutes to get to class, but it might take someone else 20 minutes. Um, so I think really trying to build in those stories and having people say, wow, that is not ever something that I have had to think about. So how do I maybe think about it a little bit differently moving forward has been really powerful for me. That's really great. I, I think that, um, one of the other things that you talked about that I would actually parallel, because I know you, you're actually a friend of mine, and I think you're always really hard on yourself. But similarly, I think the unsocializing of understanding even how, um, in at least U.S. culture, how Christianity shows up mm -hmm. is that it also, whether you do or don't identify as a Christian, meaning Catholic or Protestant, you have certain days off of work automatically, and then other folks of other faiths don't have their religious holidays off. So being able to provide the space for that is very similar to what you're talking about of just noticing what you have access to and who else doesn't have access. So it's very similar. Um, are you ready for my two favorite questions? I am. My first favorite question is, what have you changed your mind about lately? Oh. I have tried, and I think I'm working to make a mental shift, um, changed my mind about um, fitness. And I have also incorporated this into thinking about who has access to be working out in, you know, a gym or when it comes to workouts online or the money that people, like the industry that is fitness culture and the idea of, I don't need to be a certain size in order to feel fit and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a huge mental shift that is happening. And I think we're seeing it happen um, in the mainstream, right, is, you know, folks like Lizzo are coming out and being like, own your body, love your body, be who you are, and just be fabulous and feel great about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been happening for quite a few years, but it's starting to be, you know, like on the VMAs, in your face, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, Right, exactly. Um, and I have definitely been shifting my mind around like what that looks like and what does moving your body mean? Is it to get to a certain size or a certain number on the scale? Or is it just to feel good and to feel healthy in your body? Awesome. Great answer. And first time that's been the answer. Oh, okay. um, what do you absolutely know? I absolutely know that love has the power to change lives. Mm. I am so confident in that because it has 100% changed mine. I often talk about the fact that I'm adopted and I have a lot of love both in my adoptive family and in my biological family who I've met. Um, and it has 100% changed and shaped my life. And I have seen that happen for many other people. Well, that's awesome. Um, are you ready for the lightning round? Yes. So I have these icebreaker cards. You picked three random numbers, 20, 17, and 31. There's okay. easy, intermediate, and deep questions. So number 20, first question of the lightning round is intermediate. Who has been one of your most influential people in your life and why? My grandmother um, is my mom's mom. She is um, the rock of our family and also our guiding light just a phenomenal lady, super strong, super independent. I get awesome. those qualities from her. Awesome. Okay, number 17, also intermediate. When and where have you experienced the most peace? The ocean. Convenient. On the beach. On the ocean. I know. I live near the beach now, and it is 100% a dream come true. Oh, that's great. 
Okay, last one, also intermediate, number 31. What is your go-to cook-to-impress meal, and how did you learn to make it? Oh, cook-to-impress meal. I would have to go with baking. Like date meal. Right, I know. I have to go with baking. Mm. Baking is like the go-to. So it's not so much the meal. It's like the cupcakes at the end of the meal that are like the wow factor for sure. Got it. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Tara, one, I know that this has been short, but also very good in a very short window. If people wanted to get in touch with you to learn more, how would they go about doing that? So two ways. They can email me. My email is tarahm.fuller at gmail.com. Um, or they can reach me on Twitter. And my Twitter handle is Tara Mish, M-I-C-H, tweets. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.